first event of opening session of our annual lecture series uh, started from 2015 as the Department of Political Science and International Relations. We plan to organize uh, annual lectures, uh, like actually given by prominent scholars uh, in, in the disciplines of political science and IR. Uh, and our first uh, lecture is Sarah Birch. Sarah uh, specializes in electoral politics, party politics, electoral ethics, and integrity. Uh, her works appeared in numerous journals, uh, including comparative political studies, electoral studies, and many others that I cannot name here all. Uh, she has a monograph entitled Electoral Malpractice, which is published by Oxford University Press. And most recently, uh, he published with Nicholas Allen, Ethics and Integrity in British Politics, which is published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, she served as co-editor of British Journal of Political Science from 2002 to 2011. And she was elected a fellow of British Academy in 2013. Uh, I would like to thank Sarah for accepting our invitation. Uh, it's an honor for us to have her here. And also it's a special honor for, for me because I was her student back at Essex. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Last but not least, I'd like to thank our Dean for his contributions to this event. Uh, welcome you all. Thank you also for being here. Uh, please welcome Professor Sarabach. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here. And thank you um, to Shadnam for inviting me. And thanks to the Dean for organizing this. Um, it, it is, uh, it, it's fantastic to be able to, to kick off what I'm sure will be a, a very vibrant um, seminar series, a uh, series of annual lectures that you're having, and, and great to be at a new university that's just getting, uh, getting going. It's a, an exciting time. It's also obviously an exciting time for, uh, in Turkish politics, um, because there's an election coming up. Um, I should say that I'm a comparative political scientist. I've been studying electoral integrity and electoral malpractice for about 12 or 13 years now. I'm not an expert in Turkish politics, and I'll, although I'm, I'm going to be talking um, about uh, electoral manipulation, you shouldn't interpret what I'm going to be saying as somehow a commentary on Turkish politics, because it's not. I'm, I'm basically going to be talking about my research, um, because that's what I was invited to do. Um, uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm going to be presenting some of the, the, the sort of findings um, from uh, this period of research that, that, that I've undertaken and also some speculations about the things that I'm working on at the moment, some, um, the, the, the research projects that are, that are ongoing that I'm currently collecting data for. So um, what I'd like to just start by meditating for a few minutes on the relationship between elections and democracy. Um, as we all know, elections are, are crucial to democracy as it's conceived in the modern world. Now, that's not to say that elections are the only thing that are necessary for democracy. There's lots of other things that are necessary for a state to be fully democratic. Uh, but I think few people would deny that in today's world, at least the way we organize democracy now, elections are necessary for uh, representative democracy. But I think something that's sometimes missed is that democracy is not necessary for elections. In the sense that elections are a very old institution that predate democracy by many centuries. Elections have been taking place in various contexts, have taken place in various contexts throughout the world in, in very undemocratic circumstances. And so elections are not necessarily democratic. Indeed, most elections from the contemporary world are not democratic. Um, there are approximately 187 sovereign states that hold national level elections, so elections to uh, elected assembly and, and, and sometimes to the, the executive, the president, or the equivalent. Um, but only about, depending on which measure you use, of course there are different measures, but depending on the measure, only about half of those states are considered full democracies by the various institutions that take it upon themselves to measure these things. And only about 50 hold elections that are generally recognized as being fully free and fair and um, having high standards of electoral integrity, depending, again, on which measure you use. There are a variety of different measures of electoral integrity. So it's only about a quarter of all the national level elections that are conducted that are conducted under conditions of full electoral integrity. This means most elections are flawed. Uh, and that is something that... Um, 
sometimes doesn't really uh, get adequate attention when people study elections, because the assumption behind, if you read the journal Electoral Studies, for example, the assumption behind the vast amount of political science work that's done on elections is on democratic elections, and the assumptions of a lot of scholars who study elections is that they are democratic, or perhaps with some minor infections. But the, the kind of working assumption of, of the vast majority of scholars who study elections is, is that they are basically don't have um, serious problems, and that's simply not the case. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is um, how we understand deviations from electoral integrity and um, what I'll be calling electoral authoritarianism, electoral manipulation, electoral fraud, electoral malpractice. Um, and I'd like to talk about why it is that authoritarian leaders, semi-authoritarian leaders manipulate elections, what specifically they seek to achieve in manipulating elections, the mechanics of electoral manipulation, how they go about it, and what can be done to counter electoral manipulations. I think to really understand these flawed elections that take place throughout much of the world is necessary to, to really come to terms with all four of these questions. Um, yeah, the first most obviously, is what we all know, elections are a mechanism for the authoritative allocation of power. And these days, virtually all countries in the world, with the exception of a very small number, elect their leaders through, yeah, through, through elections that are held under universal suffrage. Even North Korea has elections on a regular basis. They have a two-round electoral system, in case anyone's ever interested. They never use the second round, because they don't ever need to. Um, that's an absolute majority electoral system, and, and somebody always wins in the first round. Uh, but they, yeah, they have elections on a regular basis. And um, so authoritarian leaders are actually very fond of elections, for reasons I'll go into. But of course, open, fair elections carry risk the risk that you might lose. And so the, the, the sort of puzzle for authoritarian leaders is how can I hold an election, which you know, the international community wants me to do, um, but still may show that I don't lose. Uh, and so that, you know, electoral manipulation is the, is the answer to that, that you manipulate the election so you make sure you win. However, I would go beyond that and say it's not just about holding elections because the international community wants authoritarian leaders to hold elections because it looks democratic. It's not just about international legitimacy. Elections actually serve a number of purposes for authoritarian leaders. They're actually useful in a number of different ways. And they can help authoritarian leaders to monitor the citizenry and the opposition. So this is this is very common in uh, the Soviet Union, for example. The Soviet Union elections, electoral participation was not technically compulsory. You didn't have to vote. There was a lot of pressure on people to vote. You didn't have to vote. But the state monitored who voted and who didn't vote. So you know they keep track of you if you want to vote, and then they could work out perhaps you you know maybe you were, maybe you were opposed to the regime. Maybe you want a full supporter of communism if you vote on a regular basis. So elections provide an opportunity for um, uh, leaders to kind of flush out who is opposed to them, to work out who favours them and who is opposed to them. That can be very useful information. So they're intelligence gallery exercise. Um, elections also are a means of communicating the leadership's agenda to the people, communicating their priorities, communicating their ideology. Uh, elections are a time in, in any country in the world where leaders talk about their plans, they talk about their ideology, they talk about their policy platforms. Um, and so they're in a time of intensive communication and intensive um, ideology construction. Uh, and this is an important device whereby uh, leaders can justify their, their policy decisions. Uh, elections also provide a veneer of legitimacy, both um, international but also domestic. If, if leaders are elected, they can say to their people, you know, I was elected, people voted for me, I have legitimacy because I was elected. Uh, and and they, um, if the population believes that a significant number of other people did go and cast a vote for the leader, then they're aware that that leader will be very difficult to remove by simple popular mobilization, because people have actually got out and voted for, for, for that leader or that political party. And so it's, sort of, it's, it's a signaling device by which uh, citizens, perhaps not intentionally, but citizens signal to other citizens their willingness to obey the regime. Okay, and this, every time there's an election and the winning person or political party 
uh, comes out of the election having won, signals have been sent by the citizens to other citizens that not enough of us really want to oppose this political party or this leader. Um, and so people know that if they were to oppose the, the leader in power, especially in a very authoritarian state, that there would be that would be that would be very risky and very dangerous. Um, elections also are an opportunity to distribute resources within an authoritarian regime. And there are some states like, for example, Syria before the recent crisis. Israel is another example where elections are big machines for clientelism. Elections are where political parties dole out the goods to their supporters in exchange for votes. And there are vast party machines that distribute resources in this way. In that sense, elections are a time when people get something. Uh, they can make demands on politicians before elections. And they more likely that the politicians will listen to them for those couple of months in the relative election. And they may often get something in exchange for their vote. They might get a place at university for their child, they might get uh, a job, they might get help with a you know, financial problem they have, they might help get help with uh, paying hospital fees for their elderly relative or something. You can often get something out of an election if you go about it the right way. Um, and there are opportunities also through which the regime can co-opt um, people, um, po potential opposition members or other people who are talented individuals who the regime does not want to lose. And so they co-opt them by giving them a seat in the assembly. They co-opt them by giving them an opportunity to get elected and become a member of the regime. So they're a recruitment device for, for the regime. So they're a way for the regime to distribute resources both within and totally within the regime and to the population in, in, in a way that's efficient for, for the regime. So elections, in addition to serving the function of, of electing people, they also serve a number of other functions for any regime. It's not just an authoritarian regime, but for a democratic regime, some of these same functions are served, um, and certainly for semi-authoritarian and authoritarian regimes are served as well. Okay, just a couple of definitional things. When I talk about electoral integrity, um, I think a good working definition of electoral integrity is inclusive and impartial electoral institutions. You need uh, the processes through which electoral elections are administered to, to include everyone. Everyone who wants to vote is allowed to vote. Everyone with certain obvious restrictions based on citizenship and age. Everyone who wants to contest the election, to stand for election, um, is should be allowed to, to stand for election, again, with... Uh, in every country there are some restrictions on who's allowed to stand. Um, in addition, the elections have to be conducted in certain circumstances for, the, for people to really be able to make a fully informed democratic choice. There has to be the normal freedom, freedom of information, freedom of belief, freedom of expression, freedom of association, so that people can really make up their minds, have adequate information about the different options um, in the election, um, and can you know, freely associate to campaign who they, for who they want to and so forth. Um, and there has to be rule of law, that everyone has to be treated equally under the law and they have to be uh, aware that they're going to be treated equally. So if the election, some problem with the election, people can bring complaints and those complaints can be dealt with in a fair way. So these are all the conditions for electoral integrity. Electoral malpractice is, um, under my definition, simply the abuse of electoral institutions and processes for partisan um, gains or personal gains. Okay, so that's just a couple of definitions so you know what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so the next question uh, I think it's necessary to address is the how, the mechanics of electoral malpractice. So say you're an authoritarian leader, you said, well, I know that some people support me, um, partly because I give them things every time there's an election, but I know that perhaps I'm not sure that enough people support me for me to be democratically elected, so I know I'm going to have to get engaged in some electoral manipulation if I want to be sure of winning the election. And so what am I going to do as an authoritarian leader? You know, what, what's the menu? What things can I do? Well, I think the things that you can do if you're an authoritarian leader to, get, to make sure you get elected, you can manipulate the, elect the, 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 the election in three ways. You can manipulate the electoral institutions, you can manipulate the choice that voters make, or you can manipulate the actual voting, the electoral procedures. Now, if you think about these three strategies, they carry different levels of risk. And probably the best strategy for most leaders is to manipulate the electoral institutions. It's not particularly risky, because if you have a majority in parliament, a law can be passed that is perfectly legal, no one can say it's legal, 
And those institutions can then be designed in such a way as to maximize your chance of winning the election. You might pass laws that, for example, regulate who's allowed to contest the election and prohibit certain um, people from contesting the election, like uh, there have been some cases where uh, you know, someone who wanted, who was a likely presidential candidate, perhaps was not born in the country, they were born in a, in a neighboring country. And so you pass a law that says you, you have to be born in this country to contest the election. Uh, and then you've eliminated your potential con uh, rival. Um, or you can, uh, you can engage in gerrymandering and malapportionment, which is a favorite tool, which means why in, in Bahrain, where they have a, a majority that comes from one religious group, they have, a, a, lo and behold, the elections always produce a majority for the other religious group. It's, it's always the, the Sunni minority that wins the elections. Why? Well, it's, it's you know, simply because of the way the electoral constituencies are drawn, that um, the Sunni areas have uh, contain a much smaller number of people than the, the Shia areas. The Shia areas have these huge, vast constituencies with many, many times more people living in them than, than the Sunni areas. And so you get this type of malapportionment, and the same happens in Malaysia, the same has happened in many parts of the world. Um, you get this malapportionment that, de that delivers a majority to the, the leading group in society. Uh, and there, there are many, many aspects of electoral manipulations that can be, uh, uh, electoral institutions that can be manipulated. Suffrage, uh, the way the polling stations are allocated, you can put lots of polling stations in the areas of government support and very few polling stations in the areas of opposition support. All these little minor aspects of electoral institutions can be manipulated through the legal, you know, formal legal procedures. Um, and if a leader has a majority in parliament, this is also a very cost-effective way of manipulating the elections. Because you know, it, just, it doesn't cost anything, you just have to have your majority in parliament pass the law. And then it gets enacted, and the rest of the election can be perfect. You can be, have no manipulation in the other aspects of the election, everything can go very well on polling day. The election observers can come in, they say there was no problem at all, there was no vote buying, there was no ballot box stuffing, there was you know, no miscounting, everything's absolutely perfect because you've manipulated the institutions very well. However, many leaders aren't confident that this will be sufficient and in many contexts, especially with the international community that's very vigilant and examines electoral laws a lot, very critical when you pass certain laws, um, it may not, you may, you may find that you lose legitimacy if you manipulate the electoral institutions <laughs> too much and too egregiously. So a lot of, and, and the leaders may still not be confident that they can comfortably win the election simply through the manipulation of electoral institutions. And so many leaders say, well, I need to do something else as well. And they, the second um, choice for a lot of, uh, of leaders is the manipulation of, of the the decision that voters make when they go to vote, to try to somehow alter that decision so that people don't vote for what would otherwise be their preference, but they vote for some other uh, option. And you can do this through giving them incentives, vote buying, which is very common, although expensive. Uh, you can do it through disincentives, <coughs> intimidation, harassment, either to get people to vote for someone else, although then you have the problem of the secret ballot that you can't always control, or just simply get them not to vote. A certain area of the country, or a certain area, certain parts of, uh, of certain cities where you, where you know that there are a lot of opposition supporters, if you're the incumbent, you can simply send the police and thugs and the army out to stand outside the polling station, look very intimidating, and perhaps um, harass people as they're going into the polling station, uh, and then you, you put a lot of pressure on people to, uh, to vote a certain way. This is very common, for example, in Egypt in the previous uh, regime. Uh, when there was a lot of harassment of uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, voters who were identifiable by the way they dressed, particularly the women. Uh, and so, you know, they, they were especially the, the women wearing, wearing headscarves and veils were harassed when they went to the polling station. And this was a deterrent, a lot of women just didn't go vote. Um, and so, so uh, disincentives such as harassment and intimidation um, are a way of, of keeping people out of the votes. It's actually, um, there was a, a recent court case in, uh, not far from where I, I live in London um, where the, the, this was found to have taken place in uh, a local election um, and the, the local mayor was removed from office because he was, his supporters were found to have been intimidated people outside the polling stations on the day of the election uh, and put too much pressure on them and used various other tactics to, to pressure them into voting a certain way and he was, he was found to be guilty of electoral corruption, he was removed from office. So it's not just in 
in um, you know, it's not just in, in countries that are authoritarian. It happens, happens everywhere. Um, and then abuse of resources is a very common way of trying to alter the way people vote. Um, using state resources to, to contribute to an election campaign, so state vehicles, state um, television, state media, and so forth, um, using those to the advantage of one political party uh, when they should be neutral. Um, and also deception, um, slander, saying things about candidates that are simply factually inaccurate. Or my favorite example, I think, of, of deception is in, in Ukraine. I think this was before the 2004 election. Uh, one of the political parties printed, forged um, an entire issue of their rival's newspaper. The rival party, the Socialist Party, had a newspaper that they printed every day. And um, one of the other political parties printed uh, a forgery, an entire how many thousands and thousands of copies of this newspaper, where they said you know, ridiculous things that made the socialists look really bad um, as a way of making people think the socialists were, were not the body that they should be voting for. And it's very good forgery too, and it fooled a lot of people. Uh, so there are lots of ways of altering the decisions that the voters voluntarily make at the polling station, or putting pressure on them to vote a different way from the way they would uh, voluntarily vote. And this is this is a good strategy because often it's very subtle and international observers and even domestic observers don't always pick up on all the things you do. Vote buying, for example, is very difficult for uh, observers to detect. It's often done you know, behind the scenes, even though it may be context the same. For example, the Philippines, where it's very common, vote buying is very common. Everyone knows it happens. Absolutely everyone knows it happens, but no one sees it happen because it happens quietly. And so it's very difficult for any evidence to be produced of some of these of intimidation. Um, and the abuse of resources also you know, may be difficult to document that uh, the certain resources are abused. Obviously, if it's abuse of, say, state television, it's easy to document because you can just have to watch the television to document it. Uh, and media abuse is easier to document. But some re uh, abuse of, say, vehicles that belong to the state for electoral, electoral engine, uh, electoral. Uh, uh, electioneering purposes may be more difficult to, to document. Um, now, the manipulation of vote choices can be relatively expensive because some of these activities are fairly expensive. If, if you can use state resources to, to pay for it, it can be quite cost effective. But still, it can be logistically or difficult to organize. I mean, paying votes for votes retail is, is, is a very complicated and costly way of getting votes. But it can be a very effective way of um, manipulating uh, the, the voting. But we're still having uh, an election process on election day that, 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 that's fair. And so the international observers come in, they watch them, what goes on at the polling session. They say, yes, everything was absolutely fine, no problems. And you know, they say the election was OK. And so the implementation of vote choice and the implementation of electoral institutions are, in my research, and I've done in other people's research, are the most common types of electoral manipulation. When we think of electoral malpractice, electoral manipulation, we think of ballot box stuffing, um, manipulation of the electoral register, miscounting, mistabulating the votes. That's what we think of, the classic fraud. But actually, that's the least common form of electoral manipulation in the research that's been done on this. That's found to be the, the, the least common. Why is it least common? Because it's very risky. Most of the things that you would have to manipulate to manipulate the electoral register, uh, to manipulate uh, the, the actual voting process and the vote counting process can be documented, particularly in, in the contemporary era. You have uh, a lot of election observers, both domestic and international, observing all aspects of the election. You can manipulate, um, uh, you, can, you can document electoral manipulation of procedures <laughs> very well. And um, it's the type of thing that gets you uh, observer reports that are the most critical. But they say there was fraud, there was ballot box stuffing. That's the type of thing that it's clearly not a democratic election. Whereas some of these other things, more subtle pressure or altering the institution slightly. Those types of things don't get you such negative observer reports. Those are kind of you know, slightly more uh, sophisticated types of electoral manipulation. Whereas if you're stuffing the ballot boxes, then there's no, you know, there's no way anyone's going to say your elections are, are democratic. And the manipulation of voting procedures can be quite expensive because all of those polling officials, or all of those people in counting stations, in order to do that, 
you've got to give them an incentive. And very often they want some money to do that. And you've got to organize it logistically. I mean, you know, there's millions and millions of ballots, and you've got to shift them one by one to make sure that, you know, that dead person who was, you know, put on the electoral register, somebody goes, goes and votes for them. It's a huge logistical challenge. I mean, running an election is a, bad, a big enough logistical challenge anyway, even if it's a free and fair election. But running a fraudulent election is a much larger logistical challenge. And doing it so that not, you know, not that many people find out and not that many people can document, it's a huge logistical challenge. It's very, very difficult to engage in fraud. So, not surprisingly, that's the least common form of electoral manipulation. The manipulation of uh, electoral institutions and rituals is the most common. Although there are always people, uh, the leaders in authoritarian states and semi-authoritarian states, who get desperate and who decide, well, it looks like I'm really not going to win through these other mechanisms that I've used. I've got to do something. Uh, classic case, it's in sort of all the textbooks on this, is Mexico, 1988. The election, on election day, the votes were coming in. They weren't going the right way for the president, the presidential administration. The presidential administration <coughs> sent somebody to the central place where the votes were being counted and stopped the counting. The electricity stopped. They said, oh, the electricity's gone out. No electricity. They stopped the counting. And they stopped the counting for quite a number of hours. And then, magically, the electricity came back in, and the vote total was completely different from what had happened when the electricity stopped. And this was so obvious that people completely lost confidence in the electoral procedures in Mexico in 1988. They completely lost confidence. Every, and before that, there had been some minor problems, but it hadn't been so blatant. And this is blatant manipulation. People just said, no, that's enough. And that's when they started really protesting against that in Mexico. And that was the beginning of the reforms that took place, starting in the mid-1990s. Mexican government realized they, they had a problem with what they call in, 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 in in many Latin American countries, the governability is the word they use. The country was no longer governable because it had completely lost legitimacy in the eyes of the people because they had gone too far with the electoral manipulation. People wouldn't accept it. And they had a governability problem. And they said, no, we've got to have free and fair elections. And so they gradually reformed the electoral system. And the, 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 the president who presided over this blatant manipulation of the, the vote counting he actually admitted it in his memoirs. He published his memoirs after he retired. He published his diary, you know, his diaries, and he said, I did this, I admit, you know, I, I, I rigged this election. I'm guilty, I'm sorry. Um, and so, you know, everybody knows that that's what happened to you. And, and he said, you know, that was when we realized that we couldn't do this anymore. We had to change the system. People wouldn't accept this. And so that was the beginning of the reforms that eventually led to much better. Now, you know, the, Mexico has a lot of problems, and a lot of problems with violence, a lot of problems with drug cartels and so forth, but most people recognize the elections are much, much better in Mexico now. And um, it was that blatant manipulation, people's very, very negative reaction that, that prompted the reform. So, you know, using um, blatant vote fraud is very risky. The international community will lambast you, no very negative reports, and the people will often get very, very angry, and they could have a big demonstration, and that could be very risky. So. Clever leaders try to avoid this, if they possibly can, try to avoid actual blatant fraud on the day. And that's why, um, uh, you know, people talk about fraud as a shorthand for all these different forms of electoral manipulation. I prefer the term electoral manipulation or electoral malpractice because it includes all these other subtle forms that are actually more common. Okay, so what can be done? Um, uh, there are quite a lot of states that witnessed uh, quite dramatic improvements in election quality over um, you know, a period of several elections, several years. Um, and there is a point, I think, when a lot of people, like the people in Mexico I mentioned, realize that um, if the country was going to be recognized to be democratic, they had to have better elections. They had to have more or less free and fair elections. And very often, um, the, the changes, the move towards electoral integrity, requires changes in electoral institutions, which the Mexicans undertook, most people undertake when they... Um, uh, try to introduce free and fair elections, so um, there need to be changes in, 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 in the electoral systems themselves. But it also requires changes in the attitudes of leaders, oppositions, and 
citizens. Um, and it requires a sort of a culture of accountability because democracy is about accountable rule. It's not just about somebody getting elected with an absolute majority and then going on ruling for through four years, five years. It's about being accountable for, for the way you rule. And it's about people holding the leader to account. So accountability is about leaders being accountable and it's about people who are not leaders holding the leaders to account. Um, so the, uh, obviously, the, the authoritarian leaders, leaders of some authoritarian states, states they, their attitudes need to be changed. They have to go from seeing politics as about conflict to seeing politics as about competition. And when politics and the traditional type of old-fashioned politics, before we had democratic competition, politics was all about conflict. It, you know, you wanted to fight your rivals and so you fought them in a war. Right? Um, and in a, in, in a conflict situation, your goal is to eliminate your, the, your rivals, right? You want to be the leader, you don't want anyone else in the political sphere, you want to dominate the political sphere. And so what you do, you get rid of your rivals. You just completely eliminate them. They're not legitimate, they have no claim to rule. Whereas competition, you recognize that your rivals actually have some legitimacy. So it's about recognizing the legitimacy of the opposition. That yes, we have these policies, that's a different political party, they have their policies, and some people support them, some people support us. We need to convince people that our policies are better than their policies. But, but you, but you acknowledge the, the, you know, the role of the opposition as well. So it's about moving from conflict to, to competition. And to do this, the leaders need to be prepared to accept the legitimacy of political opposition. And they also need to be prepared to accept the political compromise and power sharing that often goes with, with um, uh, working. I mean, it's very rare that any political party would have control of all aspects of the state at every level, local level and regional level and national level and upper chamber and lower chamber and presidency and so forth. It's usually the case that they have to share power with other parties at some part of the state. And so it's kind of be able to work out compromises is important. And also, of course, obviously, most obviously they have to be prepared for these elections. Um, now, what's sometimes not recognized, when people talk about democratization, they think about, well, the, the, the attitudes of the, the authoritarian leaders need to change. What's often not talked about so much is that the attitudes of the opposition also have to change. A lot of the same things that authoritarian leaders think, the way they think, is, is mimicked in the opposition. So the opposition often tends to, to have the same mental structures as authoritarian leaders in many authoritarian contexts. And so the opposition also have to be prepared to accept the legitimacy of the other electoral contestants. They have to be prepared to accept the, the legitimacy of you know, the people they're fighting against, um, the, the incumbent government, typically. And they have to be prepared to engage in political compromise and power sharing as well. And they also have to be prepared to lose elections. When they do actually lose an election, they have to be prepared to accept that they were not the most popular, rather than saying, oh, the election was rigged, if in fact it wasn't, <coughs> or to boycott the election because they don't think they'll win. They have to be prepared to compete and potentially lose. And this is, um, you know, often an important cultural shift that needs to be, take place in, uh, among oppositions as well. And something else that's not really discussed as much as it should be, I think, is the role of citizens and holding leaders to account. And we have a very, the citizenry of most of the, the, the states of the world has a, is in a different situation from the situation it was in even just 50 years ago. It used to be the case, or 100 years ago, 50, 30 years ago, citizens of many countries, they didn't have any electoral rights, um, or perhaps there were a very limited proportion of the citizenry that had electoral rights, or perhaps they could vote, but there was only one political party at elections. Whereas the vast majority of the citizenry of today's states have uh, existing in countries where there are elections for national assemblies, there is universal suffrage, and there are, in theory, at least multiple political options, the multiple political parties or you know, multiple candidates on the ballot. So this is a very unique situation in the history of, of the world, the situation we've been in for the last, say, 10, 20 years, where most people live in societies so there are multi-party elections held under universal suffrage on a regular basis. So people's what they call, we call paper rights, rights that are written on paper, rights that are in the Constitution, are granted almost, almost universally in, in contemporary world. But the problems for most people are that the implementation of those rights isn't always guaranteed in a democratic way. And so people have the rights given to them, and then they're taken away. Every time there's an election, they have the rights given to them, and they're taken away. And everybody, and 
lots and lots of people have their rights taken away on one day when there's an election. And this means that a lot of people are experiencing the grievance of having their democratic choice stolen. And they're experiencing that grievance all at the same time. And when lots and lots of people experience a grievance all at the same time, they all get angry about the same thing on the same day, that's a recipe for mobilization. That's when you can get people mobilized. Because if different people get angry about, even if it's about the same thing, they get angry at different times, you can never get them all together, because they're never all angry <coughs> enough at once to be able to mobilize them. Whereas if a lot of people get angry about the same thing at the same time, then it's possible to get collective action of some kind. And the type of collective action that is most useful in the electoral sphere is mobilization to defend electoral rights. And there has been, uh, there have been a lot of cases where there's been a dramatic improvement in electoral integrity through large-scale efforts to monitor elections. Now, when we think of election monitoring, election observation, we think of international observers coming in, you know, flying in, going around to a few polling stations on election day, perhaps having a bit of a holiday on the side, staying in nice hotels, eating at nice restaurants, flying out the next day and saying, oh yes, you know, the election was, was good or it wasn't good or whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about domestic election observers, which are becoming increasingly frequent. Um, and I think domestic election observers are much more effective in holding leaders to account. This is when citizens can actually hold their leaders to account for, for the quality of the elections. Um, and in the OSCE area, of which Turkey is uh, a part, the rights of, it, of, of domestic observers were um, to observe all aspects of the electoral process were agreed in the, in, in the 1999 Istanbul do document, which was passed when, when Turkey hosted the OSCE summit in 1999. Um, and so all of the, the citizens in all of the OSCE countries, which is 56 countries, have, um, domestic observers have the right to observe all aspects of the electoral process. And increasingly they're taking up those rights. And these are new rights in many countries. In the UK, before 1999, domestic observers did not have the right to observe uh, the electoral process. But now they do. Now, you know, now they, they monitor all aspects of the process. And it's true in many countries as well that this, was, this is a new right. Um, and domestic observers are very important in observing all aspects of the electoral process, from the campaign, with the media, to what goes on in polling stations, and, and, and prior to that, the registration process, the count, what happens after uh, the count, when votes are tallied, and so forth. Monitoring all aspects of that process and documenting all aspects of that process, which is even easier now with, with um, mobile phones and social media and so forth, and Twitter and so forth. It's possible to both document and disseminate evidence of electoral malpractice at all points of the electoral process. And increasingly, domestic observer groups are taking up this opportunity and generating evidence that can be shared around the world instantaneously about what's going on in the election. And in this way, they're holding their leaders to account. And they're requiring their leaders to hold accountable elections or to pay the cons some of the consequences. The consequences of international condemnation, possibly domestic protests, um, or just a, a severe loss in their legitimacy, a loss of people's trust, which could then have implications at the time of the next time it's an election. And I would like to emphasize that this is not just something I've been talking you know, about authoritarianism and semi-authoritarian countries a lot, but this is not just something that takes place in countries that are semi-democracies or, or non-democracies, that even in established democracies, the citizenry has to be vigilant continuously because many established democracies have lots of problems with their electoral systems. We think it's the classic case in Paris in the 1980s, um, where there was, uh, uh, there was un uncovered a massive um, coordinated effort by one of the political parties to stuff the uh, electoral register, the electoral roll. Many, many what we call dead souls, which are people who have died, but their name remains on the electoral register, um, and fictitious names were put on the electoral register. Entire block of entire um, blocks of flats were, were fictitious blocks of flats were invented that didn't exist in reality. You go to that street and there was no 41. But on the electoral register there was number 41 such and such a street with, with, with 100 residents in it. All on the electoral register and then come the election day somebody voted or you know somebody sat there completely ballot papers on behalf of these people. And this was you know this is an established democracy. Paris, you know, France was where the, you know, the Democratic rights were born, and this is where the first uh, universal suffrage took place. And so, this is it's even even in, in the contemporary era, we have these types of things. Florida in 2000, where 
you know, there's lots and lots of evidence of quite severe problems with the, the, vote, the, the voting and the vote counting. And um, most of the inquiries by academics, by local newspaper as to what happened there found that the, the wrong person won. And that changed who was president of the United States because they had electoral malpractice. Or in the, the case that I just told you about recently in, in London last year, in the local area of London near, near where I live, um, where uh, the, the mayor was convicted just a few weeks ago of electoral fraud, of both intimidation and various types of manipulation of, again, putting fictitious people on the electoral register and having somebody else vote in their name and so forth. And so it happens in all countries in the world. And in all countries of the world, it's necessary for the citizens to be vigilant, to monitor all aspects of the, of the voting process and to hold their leaders to account. And only by popular mobilization of ordinary people um, at the polling stations, during the campaign <coughs> process, in the counting and so forth, can, can people be, be really sure that the elections will remain quality elections. Once you, it's not a matter of just getting, becoming a democracy and then saying, okay, our elections are fine, we'll just leave it, we don't have to do anything more. That, you know, requires continuous attention. Um, and so, I think, to sum up what I've said, uh, so the, the root of all democracy definitely runs through electoral integrity. As I mentioned before, electoral integrity is by no means the only thing that's necessary for um, democracy. But most elections, in most contexts, are used by leaders for other purposes. They're used uh, for authoritarian ends to just allocate power, to distribute power within the authoritarian context, uh, to monitor the population, to gather intelligence, um, to send out the message of, of the leaders. So in most contexts, relations are manipulated uh, and they're used to ends that are not democratic ends. And the only way to really counter this is through an active citizenry that monitors what the state is doing, monitors all aspects of the electoral process and collects evidence of what's going on. And when things go seriously wrong, they say, enough. This word, enough, has been the campaign slogan for so many groups around the world, from Latin America to Basta to um, Ukraine and Georgia and the Middle East. That one word keeps coming back again and again in various groups that have just said, no, we're not going to tolerate this electoral malpractice, this electoral manipulation anymore. We've had enough. And that's when um, you know, leaders have to be afraid, because that's when things start to go wrong for them. When people say enough. Uh, but people have to be, they have to have the evidence to say enough. They have to have sufficient, they have to have collected sufficient evidence to convince enough people that there is really a serious problem. And that requires work, it requires um, mobilization. Um, and something, something that I often encounter is I've been to a lot of countries and sort of, uh, you know, talk to a lot of people about their elections. And a lot of people in countries where the elections are manipulated on a regular basis, they say, well, this is just the way we do elections in our country. There's no way we can ever change it. It's never going to get better. This is just, it's been going on for hundreds of years, this electoral manipulation. It will never change. But there have been a number of cases throughout the course of history where elections have actually improved quite dramatically in a relatively short period of time. We think of cases in the 19th century, such as uh, the UK, where the series of laws were, were passed in the 19, the, the 18, between the 1830s and the 1870s to improve the quality of elections. In Sweden, there was also civil service reforms to improve the quality of elections. Costa Rica, there was a very entrepreneurial president who decided he didn't want to have election fraud in his country anymore and improve the cost of the, the, the quality of elections. And in the case, some of the cases I mentioned, Mexico, Ukraine, Ghana also has had a dramatic improvement in the quality of elections in, in the 20th century. In the 21st century, we don't have so many obvious examples, but certainly in Kenya, the elections this time were a lot better than they were the previous time. Tunisia, the elections this time were a lot better than they were the previous time. So there are contexts in which elections do improve quite dramatically in a relatively short period of time. And it's usually because people were mobilized into protest, at least in the contemporary era, the 20th century, 21st century context, people were mobilized into protest against what <coughs> was just enough. Um, so election integrity is never guaranteed. People have to be continually vigilant. But with vigilance, um, citizens can hold their elections to account, so uh, their, their, their leaders to account. So I'd like to end on a hopeful note. Um, that, you know, that although electoral malpractices are probably a bigger problem than most political scientists are prepared to admit, 
Um, there is possibly a happy ending in many contexts where through a vigilant citizenry it is possible to ensure free and fair elections. Thank you very much. Circumstances for political and economic. Do we observe outright electoral breeding, outright electoral fraud? Is it when the authoritarian leaders or authoritarian parties are the weakest or the strongest? In Based the, on your experience. In the middle. In the middle. You have to. You know, international relations. Some people miss international relations scholars. There's the theory of the murder in the middle, like that you have the most violence in the, in the middle type of countries. It's the same with elections. In the most authoritarian context, um, most of the electoral manipulation is done through simply the, the institutions in North Korea. Yeah, I've never been to North Korea on election day, but I understand that everything goes perfectly on election day because they don't, yeah, they're only one party, so they don't need to do too much rigging the elections. And so in very authoritarian contexts with very, very powerful political parties, um, they don't need to do too much um, in the way of rigging the election, unless, I mean, some of it, Russia is an interesting case because Putin actually is really, really popular among the people. They would probably would vote for him even if um, he didn't rig the elections. But he rigs the elections just because he wants to, you know, 50% isn't enough for him. He, he wants to 80%, you know, because he wants to really show the opposition that there's no chance of them getting into power. Um, but it tends to be, and then in, in, in countries where the authoritarian leaders are, are very weak, it's often very difficult for them to act, add, 